Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar uh, on the Indo-Pacific post-Trump uh, era, and uh, we will discuss challenges and expectations, an event uh, that is highly anticipated uh, because everybody's waiting to hear uh, how the region will respond uh, to this change of administration. Uh, this is Institute of International Relations Prague. And I would like to uh, welcome our director, Andre Dietrich, who's going to present his opening remarks. Thank you very much, Alitsa, and uh, good morning uh, to, to everyone. It is my great honor to be opening this conference, the Indo-Pacific in the post-Trump era. Uh, in the ever more interconnected and shrunk world in which physical space collapses and Global flows become more dense and intense, and the deglobalization foreseen by some as the outcome of the current pandemic crisis seems nowhere in sight. Even geographically distant places and processes matter as we try to make sense of the rather major ongoing transformation in the fabric of global politics. I have to say I personally hesitate a little bit to excuse me, call this a post-Trump. Uh, era. To be sure, President Trump must be credited with causing disruption few individuals managed to pull out. But that said, I do believe that the transformation that we are witnessing is driven above all by structural processes. One is the change in the balance of power. Another, the emergence of entirely new planes of global politics, above all the virtual great step, if you like, where innovative ideas, but also killer apps or designs and fake news and disinformation travel with increasing speed. And we can't forget the megatrends such as climate change and the technological revolution. By the way, I understand that together with the vaccination program, climate and critical and emerging technologies have recently been identified as three key areas of enhanced cooperation by the Quad Alliance countries. Be it as it may, it is beyond doubt that on both ends of the Eurasian continent, we are keen to see what America's proclaimed restoration of leadership will mean, including whether restoration as returning to the way things were would suffice to kickstart the multilateral rules-based order or whether some innovation and adaptation in face of the many challenges faced by international society is needed to put this order in order. I'm very glad that today we can have this unique opportunity to look at these complex issues from the particular regional perspective of Indo-Pacific. Distant geographically as it may be, developing the best possible understanding of what's at stake here is vital since this may, in fact, be a region where the evolving patterns of cooperation and conflict may determine the fates of the rest of the world. This, I would like to mention, is also the reason why we at the Institute of International Relations, Prague, have a dedicated Asia-Pacific research program, of which Alitsa is the head, within the newly established Center for the Study of Global Regions, with Alitsa and several other members of of the program on the lineup of today's speakers. I am confident that today's event will contribute to expanding this understanding, and I'm particularly grateful that we are organizing this together with our Japanese friends as yet another product of our fruitful cooperation and a testimony to the fact that in the increasingly globalized world, not only may even local challenges easily develop into systemic ones, but also also, that there is growing potential for cooperation to address them and share fundamental values and beliefs about how political life should be organized. So thank you all very much and enjoy the program. Hello, everyone. My name is Alica Kizekova, and I'm the head of Asia Pacific Unit at the Institute of International Relations, Prague. And today we are going to have great discussions about the Indo Pacific as part of our collaboration with various countries, different continents um, in the era post uh, President Trump. So, we're going to explore some expectations and challenges that are ahead of us with the Biden administration. 
Uh, this first part is going to be uh, interesting because we are connecting uh, Prague, Czech Republic, with uh, Japan and Australia uh, to get insights into different topics by well-established um, researchers, commentators, experts, academics, and uh, I'm very grateful for their time. Some of them are connecting in the evening, so it's a bit uh, harder probably uh, to, to focus, but uh, we'll still be able to deliver some important remarks. So the way we are going to proceed is each speaker will have 10 to 15 minutes and they will deliver their remarks. So if you can please just keep your questions um, until the end and uh, you can write them on the actual, uh, below the actual stream and we will be able to gather all your questions and ask at the end of our presentations. I'm just going to quickly introduce um, the speaker. So we have Mr. Uh, Hiroyuki Akita from Nikkei, uh, Japan, commentator who's going to talk about Japanese perspectives on Biden's approach to China. Uh, then we have Dr. Lara Ankapaepa, who is the Special Research Fellow at the Institute of Policy Studies at uh, Suda University in Japan. Uh, then we have Professor Rosita Delios, uh, who is connecting from Bonn University in Australia. And then we have uh, Dr. Jan Hornad, who is the Head of Department of North American Studies at Charles University, Prague in the Czech Republic. Um, I will not uh, take up too much uh, of valuable time, and I invite Mr. Hiroyuki Akita to provide his remarks first. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning for people in Prague, and good evening for those in Japan. I visited Prague uh, for uh, a few years ago, and I really miss not only very beautiful city, but also very delicious beers. I enjoyed. So I really hope, sincerely hope that we will be able to catch up face to face in near future. So I try to finish my remark in 10 minutes. And uh, specifically, I'd like to make uh, three points about uh, US China competition from a Tokyo perspective. Uh, point one is the changing nature of this US China competition after this pandemic. And second, uh, the prospect of this uh, com strategic competition in coming years. And thirdly, I'd like to, and lastly, I'd like to uh, analyze the Japanese strategic options to deal with this new reality. So point one, uh, changing nature of this strategic competition. As we observe from Tokyo, uh, the, before the pandemic, uh, basically, this competition was over the two domains. One is high tech, and uh, second is geostrategy. Uh, specifically speaking, maritime uh, security uh, in South China Sea and East China Sea uh, mainly. But uh, after pandemic, there was third element added to this competition. That is confrontation over the political regime, especially in China. Uh, why? Uh, because unfortunately, because of this pandemic, more than 500,000 Americans lost life. Um, whether, and it has, this number, as we know, uh, is more than the death toll of World War I, World War II, and the Vietnam War together. So it's very catastrophic. And whether it is correct or not, but there is a narrative being shared in the United States, uh, according to public polls result recently, this narrative is that uh, China or Chinese Communist Party is partly at least is responsible to the damage given to US. For example, according to Rasmussen poll uh, center, um, majority of America, there are a growing number of American people who believe that China should compensate economic damage caused by this pandemic. So this narrative will lead to a third element of confrontation. That is, if 
communist party regime. So the problem is, co- cause of problem is not that high, not only high tech or maritime or geostrategic competition, but the communist party regime itself. Because n- narrative goes on uh, that if communist party regime allowed uh, freedom of press or f- freedom of expression, maybe there will want to be any cover up of outbreak of pandemic at the initial stage so that China could have prevent this uh, virus to spread to US or others. Again, I'm not saying it is correct narrative or not, but the important thing is that this is being shared by American people gradually and also people in Washington. So if uh, the source of competition is over the high tech or maritime security. There are room for the compromise after the tough negotiation. But if confrontation is caused by the nature of communist party regime, I think I'm afraid there aren't be any room for the compromise. So this is a kind of observation from Japan. And uh, in short, uh, Japan assumes that uh, this competition will last and further intensify. So we have to prepare for that. So this is a point one. And point second, then what is the prospect of this uh, competition? Uh, I'm afraid, but I have to say that US and Japan or other allies of the US are increasingly in a more unfavorable, not favorable, unfavorable position vis-a-vis China. Let's look at the three elements. First, geostrategic competition. Um, Military balance of power in Asia had already shifted to Chinese side. Not is shifting, but had already shifted. Uh, Maybe let me give you an example. Last week, US commander of Indo-Pacific, US commander of US military of Indo-Pacific gave us interesting number. That is, uh, currently, China, China's military have five times more fighters than US have in, in the Pacific. As well, China has uh, six times more submarines and six times more warships. And in 2025, China will have three aircraft carriers while U.S. have only one. So this is a geostrategic picture, especially about military. And second, what about the high-tech competition? Still, uh, China is not only catching up to the U.S. with the U.S., but also overtaking U.S. Uh, two examples. First example is a number of patent, patent applications uh, in most important 10 high-tech areas, such as AI or uh, autonomous automobile technology, cybersecurity, and so on. Already in 2017, a number of China's patent application uh, surpassed that of US applications in nine, nine out of 10 these areas except quantum. Also, China is expanding its digital sphere of influence much faster than US. Uh, For example, uh, almost all ASEAN countries, except Vietnam, had already made a decision to introduce Huawei technology, Huawei infrastructure to their 5G network. Even though Japan, uh, U.S. Australia decided to exclude Huawei, but it is expanding in ASEAN country as well as in Central Asia or Africa and Middle East. So, thirdly, uh, what about the competition over the political regime? Now, Biden administration is increasing pressure on China's Communist Party regime more than Trump administration, as I observe because Biden uh, makes much of human rights issue, such as Hong Kong or Wiggle and so on. So human rights issue is 
virtually communist party regime's governing issue. Uh, so US is uh, mounting pressure, but China is also ex express, ex uh, spreading its a narrative that is China's political system is much, is much more superior than that of the US. Look at this COVID-19 situation. China is doing much better to protect the people's lives than US. I'm sure that the democratic country in Asia will not buy this narrative, but the, maybe it will appeal to some of the country. So uh, in short, uh, US and allies are in bad shape if we do not take effective measures to counter. It leads to a third, last point. What Japan will and should do to deal with this new reality? Uh, Japan's plan A, plan A is to further enhance US-Japan bilateral alliance and to deal with China. Actually, Japan has been doing it by expanding its defense budget. Still, it's small, but expanding. And also, Japan is deepening its uh, interoperability of uh, US military and Japanese self-defense forces. But uh, there is a growing sense in Japanese government that the bilateral alliance with US is not sufficient to push back. So now it comes plan A dash. That is to establish regional security framework, multilateral framework to supplement US Japan and US Australia and US South Korean bilateral alliances to deal with China. So that is a quad. Uh, quad leaders uh, met for the first time bilaterally, uh, virtually last week, and agreed on uh, a vaccine and climate change and high tech cooperation. So I'm sure that Japan will pursue and accelerate the cooperation within the uh, quad framework and also try to reach out other countries like ASEAN and also even European countries. So lastly, uh, how should I, how do I assess this effort? Will it be successful or will it be failure? I don't know, but I think there is a serious challenge. That is, there is a difference of the priority among the Quad members and also Asian, uh, Asian, Asian countries about what is the goal of Quad? There is a three level of goal. The lowest goal is to share interest. So vaccine, climate change, those are all sharing interest. We are doing, we will do that. But the higher level of the goal is to sharing norms, uh, sharing norms of international law and the UNCLOS and maritime security order and so on. And then highest goal is to sharing value of democracy and freedom and so on. U.S. Biden administration want to pursue to achieve highest goal, but if that that me if U.S. will pursue that, maybe we cannot accommodate country like Vietnam because Vietnam is a one-party communist party regime, and also Cambodia or some other country. So Japan would like to pursue a norms sharing approach, but maybe ASEAN want to. Uh, start with a sharing interest approach. So the picture exists, the picture of Quad exists, but it looks differently depending on US, Japan, and ASEAN countries. Thank you. I stop here. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Hiro uh, Akita from Nikkei, Japan. I think uh, you provided some uh, quite strong points um, that we can explore further, especially I think the one uh, you suggested in your introductory remarks on the um, political system and that confrontation. And, and I think that's something that I will definitely tap into in our discussion. But what I also appreciate that you touched on uh, overarching topics uh, for our panel, uh, which is on Quad, Australia, relations with Japan. And, and I think uh, um, that's something that our other speakers will go into more detail and, and we can all have a conversation 
about different perspectives. So I thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I also, touch up, I, I, also touch up on the, I also touch up on the Czech beer, how they are oh. delicious. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, that was the refreshing you. part of your talk. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> and now I move on to uh, Dr. Laura Ancaparepa, a special researcher, uh, as I said already, from Suda University, who will nicely uh, link to um, Mr. Akita's uh, discussion about uh, these kind of, uh, not necessarily alliances, but maybe trilateral collaborations uh, with countries that have shared values. So I'll let you explore this particular angle and uh, we look forward to your remarks. Okay, thank you, Alitza. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the Institute of International Relations Prague for organizing this event and for inviting me to be a part of it. Uh, and I will discuss about economic dimension of the Japan, US and EU relationship and during my intervention, I would like to uh, briefly focus on three aspects. Uh, the first is the need, uh, the second is the potential, and the third challenges for trilateral policy coordination in the field of economic security. And I will go straight to the first point. Uh, the need for uh, increased policy coordination arises mainly from a new risk that comes with China's emergence to global power status. And there is a growing discussion about how China, as a challenger of the existing system, make efforts to reshape global governance institution and to create parallel ones uh, based on a different set of rules and values. And that is to say that the Chinese behavior uh, brings similar risk to US, EU, uh, and Japan economic security, and not only. We can include here uh, many other countries like Canada or Australia and so on. Significant concerns are related to unfair trade practices and especially China's use of economic and financial tools to achieve political goals. And there are also attempts uh, from China of control over supply chains of critical materials to target investment around the world. And moreover, China's enlarging footprint in the critical sectors and infrastructures create risk for security and uh, resilience uh, in time of um, um, increasing economic competition or in time of crisis. From this perspective, we can say that the coronavirus crisis can be considered a wake-up call for Japan, for EU, uh, and many other countries regarding their reliance on China for medical supply because it exposes, uh, this crisis exposes actually the risk of excessive de dependence and the importance of supply chain uh, resilience. However, the dimension of Chinese power and the high degree of economic interdependence make it more difficult for one country or organization, be it Japan, uh, US, or EU, to deal with such risk. And this situation more make uh, more necessary than ever coordination uh, of their policy. In addition, uh, we consider that, we tend to consider that relationship between EU, US and Japan is built on common values and shared interest, including maintaining the existing rule-based system of global economic and financial governance. Of course, this view has been questioned during Trump administration and his major uh, actually measure actually damaged the trilateral relationship. And this is the reason, the second reason, which make coordination more necessary. And it is expected that the new administration in the White House uh, has the opportunity to restore the damage link and also to uh, implement and make possible uh, this coordination. 
this was my, the first point. And moving to the second point of my uh, discussion, I would like to emphasize uh, that despite sheer interest that I mentioned between the EU, Japan, and the US, the, co the cooperation in economic security is limited and fragmented. And uh, actually, we don't have, they don't have a comprehensive trilateral platform uh, for policy coordination in this domain. And of course, we have different reasons for this, but one of the factors can be explained by the lack, um, by the, uh, the dif significant differences in, uh, in their approaches. For example, in the EU, US, economy and security are interlinked. And uh, economic security, it's a part of a broader national security. While in Japan and the EU, uh, they prefer uh, to treat security and economy as separate issue. So we don't have this uh, integrated approach that uh, US is uh, um, using. However, uh, there are several re recent developments which create positive uh, prospects for cooperation. And I will mention first, current developments showing a change uh, in the Japanese and EU attitudes toward economic security. Uh, and this change is concretized in measure and policy that might bring them closer to the US approach. For example, only in two or three years, Japan has established a different measure, has put in place different measure. Uh, for example, it has established an economic unit at National Security Secretariat. It's revised its foreign exchange and foreign trade act act to regulate trade, enhance investment screening, protect technology. It has listed over 500 companies under the category of core industry. Uh, and also more recently, it allocated around 2 billion US dollar as support for its company to reduce over dependence on one country for critical goods. Uh, this is mean that Japanese company will try to shift their production capacity and building a resilient supply uh, chain. And on its side, the U European Union has also slowly uh, updated its policy and has adopted a set of defensive economic tool, like a new framework to regulate foreign investment, to control foreign subsidies or international procurement, also, um, it creates a strategy for ICT, AI, and big data. And um, very important, it has uh, clearly defined uh, what are its critical uh, sectors and infrastructure. So these are essential steps that indicate a shift uh, in the traditional approach of Japan and European Union and a, preoccupation, a growing preoccupation for economic security. And when it's come to trilateral cooperation, uh, there are two frameworks that can be mentioned here. And the first is uh, the trilateral meeting of trade minister, uh, which was a valuable tool for uh, all of them to coordinate position of China uh, on issues related to uh, fair trade practice, forced technology transfer, um, and market access restriction. And the second framework, uh, it's the Trilateral Conference on Critical Materials, which also provide um, a very valuable, uh, useful mechanism for exchanges regarding uh, research and development, but also for cooperation aiming to prevent supply disruption of critical material. And while the scope of these two frameworks is limited, they provide a good uh, environment for discussion and a basis on which future cooperation can be built. And uh, the new administration at the White House, uh, it's another reason of, uh, why I consider that the prospect uh, for coordination look more optimistic. Uh, Biden administration indicated that it will maintain China's assessment as a strategic competitor, which means that we can probably continue to uh, see uh, that U.S. adopt a, a strong stance toward China. But uh, Biden administration made it clear that uh, it will seek to coordinate its action with all main partners and allies. Uh, and this, uh, the recognition 
that only through joint effort uh, can face emerging risk uh, coming from China. It's a significant departure from uh, the previous administration. And it's a plus and it's a good uh, point for uh, the potential of economic security uh, cooperation. In addition, we can also observe that Japan, EU and US uh, are becoming more aligned in the perception of threats confronting their economic security because their main concern actually overlap. And we can identify common concern regarding investment regulation in strategic se sectors, protection of emerging uh, technology, resilience of supply chain, uh, resilience facing economic coercion, uh, and also common rules on data flows, e-commerce and AI. And that's why uh, we can expect to see that existing frameworks can be expanded to cover such a, a area of uh, common concern. And increasing exchange might finally lead uh, to creating a more comprehensive platform for policy coordination, which can be extended to include new members uh, such as Australia, Canada, uh, and all India, or all those who are uh, willing to take part. And um, however, uh, and I will move to the last point of my intervention. However, this triangular cooperation is not free from challenge. Uh, and I would like to point only two of them. And I think maybe this can be some other challenge can be a subject of um, our uh, discussion. So one, uh, the first of them, it's related to the ability of EU, Japan and US to manage the existing competitive dynamics uh, and contentious issues for their relationship. And here I'm referring to different disputes related to uh, state aid to Airbus, digital tax, steel, cars, um, audiovisual markets, and so on. So there are several issues that have a disruptive potential for their cooperation, especially if uh, they are ill-managed. And uh, moreover, the current pandemic and the need for a rapid economic recovery at domestic level can create uh, additional uh, pressure on all of them. And the second one, and probably uh, um, or most significant uh, challenge, arises from the EU. And the main question here is whether or not the European Union is really ready to work together with the US, Japan, and maybe, and maybe other democracy on the enhanced policy coordination in economic security. And I'm saying this because we can observe within the EU some divergent strength. On one hand, there are some Eurocentric tendencies, uh, and I'm referring here to increasing calls for EU strategic autonomy, economic sovereignty or European approach. And on the other hand, uh, the EU has to manage the tendency of economic opportunities that some of its members show in the relation with China. And uh, it's uh, uh, very um, uh, true that uh, in some EU member state, China is still considered to provide uh, more opportunity than risk. And before engaging in a more meaningful cooperation with the US and Japan, the EU, in my opinion, needs to manage internal division and the divergent interest and formulate a strategy which is accepted by all its members. So summarizing uh, my talk, the main argument uh, here is that there is an increased need and a rich potential for economic security cooperation and with a new administration at the White House and an ongoing shift uh, in the Japanese and EU approaches uh, to economic security, there are positive prospects to step up trilateral policy coordination and provide a coherent and unitary answer to common risk uh, from China. And I think that's all for me. Uh, and thank you for your attention. I want to thank you. Um... Uh, Dr. Laura Ancaparepa for your remarks. I think this is so valuable for uh, the Czech Republic, which is part of the European Union, especially in relation, as you mentioned, uh, as some sort of an um, input for Europe to uh, find a way how to resolve its internal um, 
differences, but also tap into its economic potential. And I think we don't often hear about this triangular with the US, uh, EU, and Japan um, on this kind of level where we hear a bit more substance about the policy coordination. As you say, we always hear about the shared values, but that aspect about the actual policy coordination and uh, finding uh, practical ways how to really step up. Uh, you know, we mentioned even high tech, um, which your previous speaker actually talked about as, as how much potential China has. And, and this is going to be quite interesting area of uh, probably uh, competition, you know. So um, we can definitely explore further in discussion. So I'll let you rest a bit and I'll uh, see you later. <laughs> And I invite uh, now uh, Professor Rosita Delios, um, who is uh, based at Bond University in Queensland in Australia. Um, she has a very um, long list of publications dealing with China from different uh, perspectives, strategic culture, but also philosophy, but also defense. Uh, so very widespread um, ability to assess, but I think your role, Rosita, today is really to tap into Australia's uh, strategic location between the great powers. So I'll let you um, deliver your remarks and I'll see you after your um, delivery. Thank you very much, Elisa. Well, mine is, uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed the other two presentations and I'd like to add the um, cultural dimension uh, through strategic literacy. And it's called... The Continent in Between, Australia's Quest for Strategic Literacy in the Post-Trump Indo-Pacific. So what is strategic literacy? Like cultural literacy and strategic culture, it is a hybrid term that selects a particular aspect of a field of knowledge to investigate a problem. Strategic literacy embraces the idea that the understanding of the mindset, doctrine, organisational structure and symbolism of other political cultures is an essential learning tool for 21st century statecraft and strategic policy settings. It serves as shorthand for the needs of a diverse region with deep traditions and entangled futures. It is important for Australia as it sits in between strategic culture, the, the, the strategic and cultural zones that characterise the region. So why is Australia the continent in between? Geography is one reason. Uh, it is a two ocean continent between the Pacific and Indian Oceans. And now we are no longer referring to the Asia Pacific, but to the Indo Pacific. So Australia is in between those two. Culturally and historically, it is between Europe and Asia. Yes, there are people from all over the world who form Australia's population. But the, the historical um, uh, the identity of, of, of Australia, having come from Europe, in an Asian region is a distinguishing feature. Indeed, in the, after the Cold War, um, Australia was described as a torn region by Samuel Huntington when he looked toward the clash of civilizations belonging to, do, to, to different uh, cultural systems. In terms of great powers, Australia lies between reliance on the United States for its defence and security and China for its economic well-being. China being Australia's biggest export partner, accounting for about 27% of Australia's uh, trade with the world. So clearly Australia is doing very well with both parties. However, it's in a bit of a bother because as those two parties have increased stress and Australia is caught in the middle, and in between, Australia also suffers from this situation. But Australia does understand the importance of being a US ally in a troubled region. By comparison, China, like Russia, are, are different in their understanding of what it entails to have allies in the 21st century international system. Having been better at managing other countries through asymmetric relations and rather than um, equal relations, their strategic culture created a different mindset. And this comes as a poor preparation at a time when allies are the key to US power in the Indo-Pacific, not only the numbers of ships and aircraft, which indeed are also important measures. 
In a moment, I will talk about timeliness in policy approaches as a concept well known to the Chinese strategic tradition, but not always adhered to. So grasping the significance of alliance relations that are increasingly mutual rather than unequal in their import, because Australia was the junior partner for a long time and still is in many ways, um, that's the main characterization. But other things are emerging now. And uh, it's, it's more a mutuality rather than an inequality. And this increases, Australia's importance increases in relationship to how successful Beijing is in its in, in global influence. And um, so, for example, in China's rhetoric, it has attacked Australia as a giant kangaroo that acts as the dog of the U.S., this ignores both China's strategic wisdom that the strong need the weak and Australia's geopolitical importance to the US, which only grows in proportion to China's role as an adversary. So while there are strategic cultures to draw from, sometimes the actions of, of uh, the political players don't always reflect this. And here we have an example of the importance of an alliance system in judging the adversary, in China judging the adversary. It, it could also be the case that China thoroughly appreciates what this alliance system is about, but is trying to weaken it um, through, through these sorts of statements and, and through punishment. Australia has been punished in the trade um, arena. And this is where geography comes in. Australia represents a well-positioned location out of which to conduct operations in the region. It is likely to benefit from increased spending under the Biden administration. A new report submitted to Congress by Admiral Philip Davidson, head of the US Indo-Pacific Command, calls for $27 billion to be spent over five years on new mobile missiles, radar systems, staging areas, intelligence sharing centers, supply depots, testing ranges and exercises with allies and partners. One project for Australia will be a strategic military fuel reserve in Darwin for joint use by American and Australian forces. However, Australia's identity cannot be a mere reflection of its alliance dynamics with the US and through, and through that how China is to be understood. The quadrilateral security dialogue comprising Australia, Japan, India and the US, as, as has been talked about, uh, just now, already expands the strategic and mental map beyond the bilateral framework in, in terms of Australia in relation to uh, America and how this is um, the, the powerful um, framework to, to view. No, it's going beyond that. Uh, the, the, what was already a trend is now much more visible. Uh, in the post-Trump era, this shows that Australia belongs, now I'm going to use different strategic language, a vast mandala. It's a classical Indian strategic template within the Indo-Pacific circle of possibilities. In this quartillion, and that's 4th century BCE, scheme of relations, Australia is not only elevated to the Mandalic regional platform, but also qualifies as an ally, or in the terminology of quartillia, rearward friend to India, as it confronts China across its land border and potentially at sea in the Bay of Bengal, which is the other side of the Malacca Strait, having achieved dominance in the South China Sea, the Malacca Strait as, as a geopolitical, it's a very important geopolitical choke point, needs to be also secured from the other part. And this is now entering the Indian Ocean, now entering uh, the importance of India and how Australia relates to India in this way. Of course, it relates to Japan as well by looking at the East China Sea, South China Sea region. But once we cross the Malacca Strait, we are engaging in another form um, of strategic dynamic. So this is important. Um, these terms are about the Quartillion Mandala. These things are not only from the historic past. These are terms still used in the strategic literacy of the region. So why the quest for strategic literacy? Australia's diplomacy in a multifaceted region characterised by diverse political, economic and cultural features is in itself a quest for strategic literacy. 
especially at a time when there is a shift in power dynamics plus a change in US leadership. One needs to read the strategic landscape from different scripts and to be able to interpret these into optimal policy for a middle power nation like Australia that sits across strategic divides but also is mandalically connected. So I'm now starting to use different strategic language to express the diversity of this region. How can Australia interpret the Chinese strategic script from its underlying classical form, not only its current manifestations in policy? Now, I'm going to borrow from the um, uh, master of, of Western strategy, Carl von Clausewitz. The grammar remains even if the policy that provides the logic changes. So Clausewitz equated war and the strategy within war to grammar and policy to logic. Indeed, Clausewitz's use of the language metaphor for how war and policy are related is like a classical ancestor to an investigation of strategic literacy in the Indo-Pacific. We are now bringing in this globalised 21st century world of Indo-Pacific all the languages of strategic culture in order to find a way forward and to deal with the problems as well. Gaining Chinese strategic literacy is perhaps one of the key points of interest for Australia to undertake. As I said, it's already undertaken through its diplomacy with other middle powers, with other allies, uh, with regional friends, how to uh, understand, uh, and even the ASEAN um, commonality of interests, how to understand um, behaviour, how to understand attitude, and how to understand not confronting in an overt fashion um, one's fears and one's adversary, because sometimes if you over-label a situation, it then becomes it. So understanding China's strategic com, uh, concepts is obviously important. And uh, we might take a leaf from the page of Sun Tzu, the, 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 just like Quartilia for India, Sun Tzu as the, as the renowned ancient military strategist for China. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. And so knowing yourself includes your allies as well. Knowing entails not only intelligence capabilities, but conceptual understanding. Taking that extra step allows for finding solutions to problems without recourse to clashes of various kinds, whether they're um, economic or even, um, you know, military clashes. Strategic competition operates equally across the domain of proactive peace, as well as shaping deterrent defence postures. As outlined by Sun Tzu, it is better to win a war before it reaches the physical battlefield. Hence, to fight and conquer in all your battles is not supreme excellence. Supreme excellence consists in breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. This represents the classic grey zone activity, and Australia can be advantaged by understanding how Chinese concepts find resonance with current modes of influence. For Australia, the optimal outcome would be to avoid any war at all, transforming competition into a non-kinetic, political and strategic process that deters and builds selective cooperation, influencing allies, regional partners and diverse Chinese audiences as well. So I realise that I've probably prepared too much material here. So what I might do is just to quickly um, say that the things that Australia needs to pay attention to are China's reforms in its military and the way in which it has um, civil military fusion and the dual use of technologies. This um, all of society, all of government approach, uh, it needs to pay a lot of attention to that. Um, and also the fusion between the Communist Party ideology and the capitalist world order, um, how well it has achieved this. It's, um, and, but the thing is, it still is in the process. And this is a dangerous time for China because it hasn't 
if anything, it's making some gains, but it's also losing a lot as well, especially in public opinion um, beyond those areas that it can influence. But it does have its belt and road. So there are pluses and minus, but this is a, a dangerous time for China and therefore it's a, it's a time of opportunity for Australia and its allies to build toward the uh, productive rather than the destructive cycle that is um, apparently opening up at the moment. Um, there are various concepts which are incredibly useful um, across cultures, various um, ideas that, that um, can be used to understand one another but also to interpret behaviours, actions, um, we're not always clear what intentions are. We often look at um, capabilities, but it's good to be able to have that background of understanding of strategic literacy. So what I'll do is I'll conclude here to say that Australia is very much a continent in between, but this is not a bad thing. It allows for greater manoeuvrability without sacrificing its alliance with the United States as it is able to seek out and hopefully apply the lessons and communicative cap uh, capacities of other strategic cultures. This is a matter of process within its own policy logic, but within the Mandalic context of a post-Trump Indo-Pacific. The language is changing. Thank you. I want to um, thank Professor Delios uh, for her very interesting remarks. I think many people learn about uh, strategies uh, from a different perspective uh, that they're probably used to uh, from uh, media or resources that they uh, consult. Uh, I personally think uh, that point about the alliance system and, and that sort of having and, and developing those relations, how, how it's vital at this stage. I think that's important. And um, we will probably explore these dynamics uh, further in our discussion. So I'll let you uh, relax your voice and, and uh, we'll get back uh, in about 15 minutes uh, for all group discussion. Thank you. And now I invite um, Dr. Jan Hornad, who is the head of uh, uh, North American uh, studies at the Charles University in Prague, and uh, he has the, uh, I guess, uh, the task of uh, diving more into the quad, which was uh, mentioned a few times actually during this conversation. And you are an expert on the U.S. Uh, policies as well, and I think um, that part uh, can get a bit more spotlight. Possibly you'll probably make more linkages about India because we are already getting questions from the audience about India. So we will come full circle uh, with this presentation and I'll just let you uh, have your remarks now. Thank you very much, Alitza. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank the Institute uh, for inviting me and I do feel humbled to speak after such uh, wonderful talks. And uh, I am afraid I will be the only outlier in uh, um, in this in this panel to actually use a PowerPoint. So at this point, I will share my PowerPoint with you, which will sort of help me uh, uh, to be on time because I'm not very good at time man management with my, especially with my courses and my seminars. I tend to uh, uh, spend a bit more time uh, uh, speaking. So uh, let's hope this PowerPoint will help me in this also. So as you said, uh, Alitza, um, I will focus a bit more on the quad and I will try to put it in the perspective uh, and in the context of uh, U.S. Uh, U.S. grand strategy towards the Asia Pacific or the Indo-Pacific, as we as we call it today, right? So uh, the the Quad has been mentioned uh, by, by uh, my by the previous speakers. Uh, so uh, I, there's probably no need to introduce it anymore. Um, but the Quad in general is labeled by its member states as a very flexible group of like-minded states, right? Of like-minded partners. It was first formed in 2006, 2007 as a sort of a coordination mechanism and in reaction to the 2004 uh, tsunami in the region. But it lived a very short life initially, right? So, so, so we this first period of the quad we identified as quad 1.0 and now since 2017 when the quad was reinvigorated um the, the the media have labeled it as sort of or commentators have been calling it quad 
2.0, right? And since then, since 2017, it has hosted a, a number of uh, working level meetings, uh, two ministerial meetings. I believe one was in Tokyo, one in New York. And as, as my uh, predecessors have uh, mentioned, uh, an historic meeting, a virtual meeting took place just last Friday among the leaders of, of, uh, of, of the quad, of the quad group. But I'm trying, I'm going to sort of put this a little bit more in broader context what the quad means, what it is, and how it fits structurally into the U.S. grant strategy. Right? So um, if we look into the last two decades of U.S. foreign policy, U.S. approach towards uh, 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 the Asia-Pacific, Indo-Pacific, uh, and perhaps it's not visible at first sight, but I believe there's a remarkable level of continuity on the U.S. side in U.S. grand strategy towards Asia in the last four presidencies. Of course, the strategic reorientation towards this side of the world is clear, and it is coupled with attempts by the United States to strengthen partnerships with basically any country, uh, any regional country that shows interest in strengthening its ties with the United States. Right? Uh, so the overall policy um, towards the Asia Pacific might have been most explicitly formulated by the Obama administration in its so-called pivot, right? But the rebalancing that the pivot has announced was already taking place during the Bush administration. Right? And some of the strategic documents from the Bush administration point to that. For example, the Global Force Posture Review, where there was a clear sort of shifting uh, of resources and forces from the Western Hemisphere into the into the Asia Pacific, right? But at the time of the Bush administration, obviously, it was a time of engagement with China to a certain extent, um, uh, attempts to socialize China, to integrate China into the liberal uh, world order, particularly through uh, its entry into the World Trade Organization. This shift was not explicitly uh, announced, and it was sort of deliberately toned down um, as not to antagonize uh, antagonize China. Right. So Obama's pivot was a uh, was more or less a belated labeling of uh, an ex or an extension also of an already existing strategic posture. Right. As is well documented by Nina, uh, Nina Solove in an article that was uh, uh, recently published in uh, the journal International uh, Relations, International Security, I'm sorry. So this is also perhaps why critics have said that Obama's pivot was uh, all talk and no walk. Well, because it was only something that was uh, announced uh, publicly, but that was already uh, taking place uh, uh, some time before then. Right? So enter Trump. And it may have seemed that he was an aberration to this sort of structural shift, right? As he, as one of his first policy moves was to drop out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Right? But otherwise, with respect to uh, partnerships in the region, right, and if we uh, sort of uh, take our minds off of his impulsive behavior and his rhetoric, um, it was his administration that reinvigorated the Quad. It was his administration that sort of renamed the Asia Pacific and connected it to the Indi Indian Ocean and, and sort of adopted what was formerly a Japanese concept into uh, the, uh, the Indo-Pacific. Indo and a term that even Europe has since then adopted, right? Individual European countries, the European Union uses this term. And we academic scholars and commentators have also adopted this, forming a, a, a sort of a new mental map, right? Which leads to what, uh, uh, what uh, my colleague was just talking about, uh, a new mental map in the strategic framework of, of the region as such, right? So even uh, with the Trump administration, we saw a continuity, at least in this sense, of expanding the partnerships, right, building them, right. And with Biden, it was presumed, uh, at least by some commentators, that perhaps he will be preoccupied uh, with issues on the home front, with uh, sort of uh, uh, damage control in terms of uh, um, recuperating U.S. relations with uh, European partners, with international organizations, et cetera. And that the Indo-Pacific and the whole region would sort of take a backseat in his foreign policy approach. But very soon after assuming presidency, his spokes, uh, the State Department spokesperson said well, uh, regarding the Quad as having, and I quote, essential momentum and important potential. And the fact that just a few weeks, we can say, you know, not even two months into his presidency, Biden has hosted 
the virtual summit of the quad leaders, right? The highest level we can get in the quad, right? So obviously before all the coordination came into place, before uh, you know the, the joint declaration that was somehow settled, this took some time before the meeting took place. So the decision to actually hold the quad meeting must have been taken in the very few days of his, of his presidency. So symbolically this shows how much weight the Biden administration gives to this, as they call it, the flexible partnership of like-minded states. So, but the continuity that is driven by structural factors, right, and that doesn't care about really who's the president in the United States, this continuity rests mainly in the shift from the so-called hub and spoke system, right, sometimes it's called the San Francisco system that you see here on the picture where the United States, since the end of the Second World War, basically, or since the Korean War, uh, uh, where the U.S. was the hub, and it had its spokes sort of tied to itself, right? Now, there's this, this shift was even explicitly mentioned basically during the uh, Obama administration and pursued ever since, right? And the, the, the approach uh, to the Asia Pacific was, was to restructure the San Francisco system. And, and the question is how, right? And so in its place, the United States is, has been working towards constructing a, a more federated network uh, model in which the Washington would lead a web of more powerful allies and partners with stronger links amongst each other, right? So most notably by helping the partners uh, increase their military capabilities. This is mostly related to India, right? But also to Japan, right? Um, it, it fits into the framework of U U.S. support for the reinterpretation of the U.S. Constitution regarding, for example, self-defense forces. It is also related to strengthening U.S. presence in Australia, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So that's one thing, strengthening and increasing the military capabilities of the partners and building greater multilateral interoperability among the partners, right? So there is a there is a support on the part of the United States in building ties, not just among the U.S. and these four, the three partners, but also among the partners. Trilateral cooperations, bilateral cooperations between India, Japan, Australia, Japan. And we can see that these trilateral networks are emerging uh, across uh, uh, across uh, 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 American partners in the, in the Indo-Pacific. And this sort of trilateral narrative uh, is, is taking place also in U.S. strategic documents, if we uh, uh, lo look into those. So, uh, what is the role of the Quad, right? As we can see, you know, from this map, every uh, uh, Quad member has a sort of a different uh, geographical understanding of what the Indo-Pacific is, right? But the goal is obvious of why we are framing it as an Indo-Pacific, that this is an interconnected region, right? And the final goal of uh, how this uh, uh, interconnected region should be structured is to have it free and open, right? The free and open uh, Indo-Pacific, that's the buzzword, that's the catchphrase, right? And the interest of all uh, the members. Right? So first of all, you know, the Quad is basically an embodiment of the term itself, of the term Indo-Pacific. And also, uh, it if... If the partners help maintain the Quad, they will also help sustain their dedication to the term of Indo-Pacific, right? This, this mental uh, map of a geographical area uh, that has str some strategic importance. From the perspective of the United States, the Quad is also a much cheaper way of maintaining presence in the region through these partners, right? Who in the end might fit into what uh, some uh, American commentators are calling offshore balancing, right? An offshore balancing strategy, meaning that the United States can sort of uh, lay back a little bit, right, and let regional partners and allies take care of regional stability. And only if there is some so, sort of more, uh, 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 let's say, um, hostile conflict taking place, that's the point where the United States steps in, right? So a greater reliance on regional partners uh, is what from the U.S. perspective, the Quad might lead to in the longer term or midterm perhaps right so uh so uh 
there's uh, an encouragement also on, uh, for bilateral and trilateral cooperation, which I was talking about, and an expansion of uh, areas of cooper various cooperation that the Quad can uh, that the Quad can bring. It also brings deterrence, right, uh, towards China. There's no no uh, no reason not to think that this is not driven by China's rise. So, um, getting to the final final points of of, of uh, what I wanted to uh, underline here, I uh, especially uh, enjoyed the remarks of uh, uh, my colleague uh, who uh, discussed uh, the the role of the Quad, whether it's you know standing up for interests or norms or values. I think the fact that um, the, we are not sure and nobody is really sure what the Quad is about. It's a strategic ambiguity that uh, that is uh, that benefits sort of everyone, and this is, I think, what the Quad members want to do: uh, create a strategic ambiguity about what the Quad is, so that China cannot get too sort of hostile about the existence of uh, of uh, uh, of this partnership. Right. But looking beyond that, uh, looking a bit beyond uh, Quad, and uh, looking into the, the following years of the Biden administration. Uh, my take on on uh, on that is a very uh, India centric. I have a very India centric interpretation of U.S. strategy towards the Indo Pacific. Right? I think the goal of the United States uh, in the end is to pull India as close as possible and provide incentives uh, for India to more effectively balance China. Right. As a senior Trump official uh, recently put it, um, the administration has started talking about the Indo-Pacific in part because the phrase captured the importance of India's rise. Right. So, uh, and observing this evolution of U.S.-India ties, I believe uh, what Ashley Tellis actually was talking about, uh, uh, and what he called strategic altruism on the part of the United States toward India. Right. There's a remarkable generosity on the part of the US where India is uh, a made, as a major defense partner to the United States enjoys certain provisions technology transfers arms sales intelligence sharing that only US ally, NATO allies do right so uh the, the quad given its informal and flexible structure is part of this attempt to maintain India within the US partnership right and to maintain india as an actor that will actively balance balance china along sort of uh, us us interests right but two last caveats to this to this india centric interpretation uh, must be mentioned and i will stop there uh, first is uh, india's paradigm of strategic autonomy right uh, which will not permit india to be too close too formal with the united states or with any other uh, members of the quad right and as uh, Indian Foreign Minister Jai Shankar men mentioned recently, uh, India is a partner, uh, not an arena. Sort of, if you're not at the table, you're probably on the menu. So India will likely want to be at the table, but will have some barriers as to how far uh, the formalized relationship can go. And the second, Biden will be pressured domestically to be more tough on India, mainly due to uh, confront its ethnocentric uh, domestic policies. We are seeing more sort of op-eds being published and commentary saying, uh, you know, Biden should raise his voice. Trump didn't. Trump had a good, very good relationship with Modi and didn't talk into domestic politics. Biden might face some pressure in, in this sense, right? So, uh, in a sense, the Quad hinges on the evolution of the India-U.S. ties, and uh, uh, which, from the complex web of relations between the Quad members, uh, the U.S.-India ties are the most precarious. Right? So, uh, I will stop there. Um, sorry for uh, taking a little bit more extra time. And uh, as I said, I'm not very good with time management. I hope you'll excuse me, uh, Alitza. I think you did great um, because, obviously, um there are there are parts of uh, audience here that actually ask questions that you already answered. So you, without knowing the questions, uh, you touched on some points and therefore made a sort of smooth transition to our discussion. And I have to point out that you are also the chair of the second part, uh, which will be after this, where you will be discussing um, your expertise with a colleague uh, Professor Sutter from um, uh, United States and others. So you'll be able to have that conversation um, from a different perspective of a chair. 
Um, but if you don't mind, I I will invite all the speakers now to turn on their um, cameras, please. And uh, I have very specific questions here. I think I will target the audience questions first and not my personal ones, just because we all had um, only about 25 minutes, uh, or if I calculated correctly, um, want to make sure that we answer the questions from the audience. So I'll start with, um, I think, Mr. Um, Akita, because there was a specific question, which is not an easy question. It's a very direct question for you. To what extent uh, might a trilateral approach of Japan, uh, South Korea, United States, towards China improve the bilateral relations between Japan and South Korea? Thank you very much for a very tough question. But it's very tough and very simple, uh, you know, how and when do country, two country, can cooperate, collaborate? Uh, when country uh, share the interest or strategic goal, whether they have good relation or bad relation, two country can cooperate. For example, during World War II, Stalin and Roosevelt cooperate each other. Why? because they share the strategic goal. So I think that the China factor is very, very crucial to define the define the bilateral relation of Japan and South Korea. In short, if Japan and South Korea will be able to share the strategic goal to deal with China within the same spectrum, that will largely help for South Korea and Japan to improve its relation. Uh, of course, I, I have to emphasize that Japan should make more effort, and China, uh, South Korea also can cooperate more to overcome the history. Uh, there is no end for this effort. But my point is that, in a realistically speaking, a uh, history issue will not be get resolved in one year or two years. But meanwhile, if we can cooperate on China, that will be a glue. Then question is, China factor will, will it work better or worse for bilateral relation? It's depending on how both Japan and South Korea perceive South Korea. Japan perceives, uh, Japan have a territory, uh, kind of Senkaku issue, de facto territorial dispute with China, and Japan relation with China is very tense. So Japan is kind of determined to ally with uh, enhanced uh, security cooperation with the US and take a U Japan is determined to take a US side to balance against China. But South Korea is uh, part of a continent. They are part of a continent uh, and uh, geographically they are in a very difficult location vis-a-vis -vis China. So South Korea is still kind of like a hesitant to join in the Pacific strategy, uh, which is understandable. Uh, and also South Korea's reliance on China's mark, economic market is bigger than their reliance together with US and, you know, to US and Japan together. So I wonder uh, how much extent, uh, I wonder if China factor will work better or worse for bilateral relation between Seoul and Tokyo. It's remained to be seen. Thank you so much. I think this is a very uh, important uh, response and it's for many a big question. So I, I appreciate that you answered it and, and provided some insight. If you don't mind, I'll move on to uh, Dr. An uh, Laura Anka Parepa because there are two questions related to your topic. One is focusing on the trilateral relationship between the United States, EU, and Japan, and uh, specifically the question was, which topic of this trilateral uh, relationship uh, or which policies that they can hold towards China, um, maybe one or more policies um, would be most neglected and why? But then there is this other question, which is very important for the audience in the European Union, um, whether EU shouldn't try to pursue its own uh, foreign policy. Uh, for instance, do not take the position 
um, in the China-US um, competition and developed trade with, you know, places such as Africa. So if you could please provide your answers. Um, okay, thank you very much for the question. Uh, and first of all, regarding the first one, uh, there are actually uh, several areas of cooperation or policy coordination which is uh, which are not explored uh, at the trilateral level. And I mentioned uh, already some of them uh, when I talk about uh, the fact that um, there, there are concern uh, that overlap uh, in um, Japan, EU and US. And here I, uh, I will mention, uh, for example, concern regarding investment regulation in strategic sectors uh, and also resilience facing economic coercion uh, and especially uh, digital um, infrastructure uh, rules on data flows and uh, e-commerce. So I think these three uh, areas are not uh, fully explored. Uh, the reason might be very different. Uh, some of uh, some sometimes, um, for example, in regard to regulation for uh, strategic sector investment, um, for a long period of time, Japan, uh, U.S., and uh, Europe have a different approach to China. So while um, U.S. Uh, have been careful and even Japan uh, regarding Chinese investment, uh, U.S. actually welcome uh, Chinese investment, especially in a period in which uh, some European countries um, face a, a financial crisis. So I think this is one of the reasons for which uh, at this moment, while all of them become now very interesting, uh, interested in pursuing uh, and um, uh, regulating more strategic uh, investment, uh, uh, investment in strategic sector, somehow there is no yet a coordination between them. But I think in the future we can um, uh, see uh, this field um, uh, and this cooperation taking place. Uh, this is especially, for example, they can. Uh, there are some ideas which have been uh, promoted by staff of Biden administration, and one of these idea was uh, an exchange of uh, information between EU and um, other par uh, US and other partners, including EU, regarding uh, companies which uh, Chinese company which invest in strategic uh, sector, and the second. Um, uh, also, uh, for the first, uh, the second uh, uh, area which is not fully explored, uh, it's as I said, digital infrastructure, uh, data flows, uh, a AI, and e commerce. And here, I think uh, this is a very important field where cooperation should take place absolutely because these priorities, these are priorities which are linked for China with the digital Silk Road. And the digital Silk Road actually seek to facilitate the expansion of Chinese technologies, especially um, digital uh, instruments, uh, 5G uh, telecommunication uh, networks, cable, and so on. So this is a very good uh, area for cooperation. Um, I, I cannot say why there is uh, not yet um, um, a trilateral cooperation may be one of the reason um, it's uh, again there are some uh, different approaches especially in regard to telecommunication uh, or um, to uh, investment in general so this is my answer for the second the first question and the sec second question uh, whether EU should uh, pursue its own policy um, my personal opinion is that uh, no, uh, because um, I think uh, at this moment it's very clear for everyone that um, Chinese um, uh, behavior actually uh, are uh, consciently and um, targeting uh, not only um, 
common value that European Union has with other democratic countries, uh, but also um, it's uh, targeting um, uh, econo uh, security, uh, it's targeting um, um, share value, share interest, uh, and also it represent um, all Chinese behavior represent a clear um, um, are clearly directly uh, directed to um, sh uh, shake the existing uh, rule based um, uh, system, be it economic, uh, be it financial, or uh, in general the current uh, world order. So I think that, uh, as I mentioned in my uh, my in my intervention at the beginning, uh, at this moment, uh, dimension of Chinese power and also the high degree of economic interdependence uh, make it very difficult for one country and organization to face this, uh, face alone. So uh, given that uh, China has shown uh, that uh, it's, um, uh, it's uh, it has shown a pattern in which um, it's uh, make use of all means uh, to pursue its geopolitical and geoeconomic goals, I think that the, I, it will be much better for EU uh, to be together uh, not only with Japan or US, but also with some other democratic countries. So I think this is a, a very important moment in which uh, this cooperation, which was not possible during the Trump administration, uh, should take place. Uh, this is the, my answer. Thank you so much for such uh, elaborate uh, answers. I'm sure the audience members are happy with your contributions. And now I have two questions for uh, Professor Delios. Um, and one of them actually um, might be uh, relevant, maybe also for um, Mr. Akita. Uh, so the first one relates to Australia's also own foreign policy. and the latest commitments that Australia made to neighboring countries um, donate uh, or allocate $100 million to distribute COVID-19 vaccines, uh, whether Australia can now somehow step up its uh, role in the region um, in areas that might be over overlooked uh, by some of the bigger players. If you can uh, maybe suggest um, how this can uh, proceed, whether Australia can have some niche in some of areas that uh, maybe the US as a leader in the region might not be um, willing to commit at the moment. And another one, which is my sort of personal uh, question that I wanted to ask early on, and, and I think you both can answer, there is this big discourse now in the US about um, literally that the United States can only win over China if there is a regime change. So what are your thoughts on these two big arguments about some sort of a competitive coexistence and um, in terms of um, China sort of, uh, I guess, slowing down in, in some uh, narratives and rhetoric and not pursuing um, more regional pro proeminence. And also there is that gloomy outlook that uh, Chinese leadership will not be able to sustain the regime and um, the, the, there will be a those literally um, regime failure um, theory applied. How, how would that look? It's a quite dramatic, um, I guess, argument. And I, and I think Mr. Akita will want to maybe elaborate because this was one of your points as a the political system is colliding. So I let Dr. Delios to reply and perhaps you can complement. So, um, yes, I'll begin. Uh, COVID uh, vaccine diplomacy is what it's called, the soft power touch, I guess. Um, and that's part of this, this quadrilateral um, identity that's emerging. It, it's not a block, it's not a security balance of power against China. It has many dimensions to it. Um, we know soft power is just as effective, if not more so, if it's applied properly uh, than hard power. Hard power is there in the background, but it's soft power that um, really delivers. Hard power helps soft power, of course. It's like yin and yang. 
But um, this COVID um, vaccine aspect, it's especially important with the Pacific Islands. Australia, you know, the Indo-Pacific is a huge area. But for Australia, the Pacific Islands are an area which uh, it's, it's its own um, immediate zone of interest. And it belongs to the Pacific Island Forum, Pacific Island Forum, which is the, um, the grouping for the region. Um, it's heavily involved. It has a history of it as well. It has its own, uh, and with New Zealand together as well, it, its own sense of this is part of um, how Australia understands itself, and as well as um, looking north to Southeast Asia. But indeed, the Pacific Islands are poor, but they're strategically important. China is cultivating the Pacific Islands and they're doing well out of both. Uh, it was like the Cold War. Um, you know, the weaker parties benefit when the, the strong powers uh, try to, to give them gifts and to advance their cause and so forth. And um, Australia understands the need to be effective in the Pacific Islands region. Um, health, it's a poor area. Health issues uh, are at the forefront. Um, unemployment, um, a whole lot of things need to be attended to. And China is active in the Pacific, just as Japan is. So what Australia is doing is, is not unusual. It makes sense. Um, as for a niche, I think its niche is to continue to talk to everybody and to be open-minded and certainly not to be talking about regime change or, or regime failure when it comes to China, not only because that is not the way to approach members of one's own community, one's regional neighbourhood, um, it's it's bad behaviour and, and bad thinking to publicise. You know, that's that you don't do that um, if you are strategically astute. Um, but it's also the case that it, it's not so easy to dismiss Xi Jinping's current manifestation of what the Communist Party is doing. He, he is, um, we've gone from, from the Deng Xiaoping of, 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 you know, biding time and hiding your strength to become an, an extraordinarily powerful country, but it hasn't arrived. It is still there. It has much to accomplish still. The Belt and Road has still much to accomplish. There are still a lot of problems. Um, it has bounced back with COVID, but it has lost a lot of admiration that it once had um, before the hard line on the South China Sea and on human rights and the way in which these are being um, pursued by um, the US administration. So Australia's niche is not to talk tough, but to talk to everyone in order to understand positions and hopefully, um, as I said, you know, being in the middle being um, in between allows it to listen to everybody, not just to talk, to listen to everybody and to try and find positions where the common interest, yes, there are differences uh, tactically and operation, the common interest strategically is being met. This is what Australia should be doing because it's in no position to threaten anybody, in no position to talk about um, extreme um, scenarios but it is in a position to help build positive ones. Thank you so uh, much. Sorry. And Mr. Akita, would you like yeah. to um, comment? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, just briefly, I uh, echo uh, the Delius' the, 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 the the uh, comment. <laughs> sorry, you know. Uh, it's all right. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, I personally, I think it is regime change approach is not good approach. And also more or less Japanese position, I think, is the same as mine. And the reason, there are three reasons. One reason one, we care about the, their action, their attitude, their behavior. And we want them to change their behavior. And so in order to do that, we are willing to collaborate with allies and US and European countries to impose necessary pressure. Also engage China to persuade them to stop bullying other country or dissuade them to uh, take bad action. Uh, so as long as they change their behavior 
to be honest, I do not, I care less about the nature of regime as if they behave okay. Second reason, second reason is that after all, it is not us, but Chinese people who choose the regime. So if they are not willing to change the regime, we cannot change the regime. And I myself, uh, you know, is, will not be unhappy as a consequence of our uh, approach to China, you know, imposing a lot of pressure to change their behavior. As a, as a consequence, maybe China's regime may change as a consequence. I'm not unhappy with that, but after all, it is the Chinese people's choice. And lastly, when the, when empire, existing empire, decline, start to decline, it is more dangerous, you know, uh, because they are internally insecure, they are losing confidence, they get nervous, so they will be more assertive in an unpredictable manner. When they rise as great power, we can kind of like predict. They are overconfident, they are assertive, but predictable, predictable assertiveness. But the empire declines, it is unpredictable assertiveness. And I don't think it's a good idea to accelerate that process because sooner or later, China will have an you know, internal problem and their regime will face some you know, uh, difficulty and may you know, change in the future. So we don't have to accelerate that process. We just focus on their behavior. That is my view. Thank you. Thank you so much for your generous reply and uh, appreciate also uh, Professor Delios' uh, remarks about the danger of making certain declarations. And, and I think it took some people by surprise to read this kind of uh, discourse, but necessary discussions to be had. Um, I will move on to Dr. Hornat and we have about three minutes left. Um, there are two questions that I want to ask, um, and then maybe, I don't know how much time we'll have, uh, but you can also touch on the last one and maybe other speakers will want to comment. But the first one is about India and whether it could be some sort of a political and economic alternative to China. Uh, that was the first question. Um, the second one which came was about Kurt Campbell's next pivot to Asia strategy involving U.S. bringing its allies together, and whether that's uh, purely to answer China or is it also related to North Korea? So I'm not sure if that would be something you could answer. And finally, I think some people are really curious whether we feel that the Trump era is completely over because President, former President Trump still has uh, quite a lot of followers and he's made some declarations. So whether you feel anyone from the uh, speakers that this is over, and if not, how much his very active uh, presence is going to disrupt President Biden's uh, bold uh, goals to make America's presence, uh, as our colleague Rudolf Forst quoted in his uh, question here, make it great again um, in Asia. So I'll leave this to Dr. Hornad and see how others can respond. Yeah, uh, thank you. The, those are great questions. I'll first uh, try to tackle uh, the question regarding India, um, and I would rather take it from a from a U.S. perspective because I do not see myself as 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 an expert in Indian politics so much. Uh, nonetheless, uh, um, uh, this is something that I believe that would be very convenient and beneficial for U.S. foreign policy in the region if uh, India were to act. As um, as a relevant political, um, democratic, right, uh, an economic alternative to China. Right. However, I do not think that at this point that is the case. Right. Um, India does attempt to, and it offers various lines of credit, uh, uh, loans, etc., to neighboring countries like the small island nations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It is trying to build ties also in those directions. So it's trying to sort of tackle. Um, China, uh, China's expanding Belt and Road initiatives and its lines of funding, right? 
But obviously, India is limited by the resources that it has at hand. Uh, there are they are obviously uncomparable to what China can offer to these countries. Right. So while China can much more easily, uh, quote unquote, bribe the countries to become its partners, India doesn't have this uh, uh, opportunity. So it has to rely on what Rosita was uh, talking about, right? Uh, and that is soft power. Um, and uh, India would be able to build its soft power momentum more if uh, it uh, were more successfully at tackling its domestic problems. Right? Uh, if uh, it could present itself as a country that is bringing millions of people out of poverty, just just like China has been to, uh, sort of pushing the narrative of its own growth, right? So at this point, um, I think it is really something that uh, the United States policy towards India is geared toward, right? Uh, helping India become that model for the rest of Asia, uh, that alternative, right? And through the Quad, right, we, we know of the so-called Build Act and all of these initiatives that the United States has been setting up in order to counter, for example, the, the infrastructure financing that China is proposing, right? So through the Quad, if India operates through the Quad, I believe that the Quad can serve as this political economic alternative by pooling the resources. And we, as I said, we're going to see how far Quad expands and what spheres of cooperation it will go into. But I see the potential in sort of pooling the resources, right? Financial resources that can be offered to regional states in terms of uh, serving as alternatives to the lines of credit that China is offering might be one of those uh, 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 avenues for further cooperation. And um, so I think I'll leave it at that. And and uh, uh, um, you mentioned also other questions that that might be relevant for for my fellow speakers. Yes. Uh, anyone would like to uh, react to the co continuous uh, support for former President Trump and the followers? Right. The, that, yes, the way that that's going to affect yeah. the current administration's yeah. efforts uh, to engage. So, Shall I? Uh, yeah, I was based in uh, Washington from 2002 to 2006 during Bush administration. And, but uh, uh, of course, I never imagined that uh, Mr. Trump will be a president. But now, I think that there will be a continuity uh, of a Trumpism uh, beyond 2024, whether he will become a president or not. Because we cannot, uh, I think I, as a journalist, I tell always tell myself that I should never over underestimate the fact that about 74 million American voters voted to Mr. Trump and two thirds of them still believe that the election was cheated. And the two thirds of them uh, support, if they are asked if Mr. Trump established his Trump party uh, two thirds of them will move out of GOP and support Trump party. So uh, this voter will never disappear beyond 2024. So I should assume that U US will be uh, will remain as a divided as much as it is now, unless uh, they deal with the very, very deep division of the society stemming from, partly stemming from the income, income disparity between rich and poor and so on. But uh, secondly, but also I think there is a huge continuity between now and after 2024, uh, even under Mr. Trump, you, uh, even, I mean, even, even if he become president or his ally would become president from 2024, that is a China policy. Whoever become a president, I think this China policy will soon more or less will continue because it is not Mr. Trump who triggered this strategic competition, but it is a state DNA. US DNA as a superpower and China's DNA as a traditional great power that caused this competition. So, it is beyond the control of the individual president. So there will be a continuity of this China policy and also US 
whether it is good or not, uh, this intensified US-China competition. Thank you. Thank you so much. If we don't have any other responses from other speakers, I would like to thank everyone for their remarks. I think it was extremely interesting and we prepared a very a good ground for the second part, which will start half past. If I'm looking correctly at times, in US it will be 8.30. Uh, then we'll have uh, Prague time, 1.30 in the afternoon. Um, Japan, I believe, will be 9.30 in the evening in Tokyo and Australia, 10.30. So everybody will have different kind of beverages by their side, depending on the time and also different level of mindset. So, but what you can look forward is actually um, people will be uh, discussing further Japan's role in the region, there will be more discussion about Japan-US relations. And we'll also hear more about the American domestic politics and how that has an impact on the competition with China. And one question that was not answered during this panel and was asked, and I apologize, we are running out of time, was about the Asia-Pacific trade uh, deals, such as RCEP and uh, CPTPP. And that will come from our great speaker from Paris, um, Professor Francois Nicolas. So stay tuned after break. And uh, my colleague, um, former colleague now, uh, actually, Dr. Hornad, who used to work with us now, is at Charles University fully, will be your chair to guide you through those discussions. So thank you so much again, and uh, see you uh, at half past. <laughs>